I'm here today to talk to you uh, not just about how we can use maths to save our planet, but more generally about the power of mathematical modeling to solve pretty much any problem that you can think of, and I will give you several examples. Um, but I want to start with a video. Um, so this video was filmed on board the Royal Research Ship, the James Clark Ross, uh, where I spent six weeks uh, sailing around Antarctica in the Southern Ocean. And I'm actually here filming a video tour for my parents. They requested a video tour of the ship. And I wanted to show you this video because it's not something I expected to be doing as a mathematician. I did not expect to spend six weeks at sea, uh, and I most certainly did not expect to encounter a Force 11 storm. Uh, so the giant cloud that you may have spotted approaching the ship is a Force 11 storm. I have just about now realized there is a Force 11 storm about to hit the ship. There we go. Uh, I start to run. I don't run inside because I'm clearly more scared of my parents and their request to finish the video that I run to the top deck of the ship. And only then do I retreat safely uh, inside. But I think this, again, this demonstrates the, the versatility or the power of the tool of mathematical modeling that I was doing this. Um, and this was part of a larger project, uh, which was looking at how we use mathematical models to try to understand uh, the Earth's climate. So climate change, the climate crisis, possibly the biggest threat to our existence as a species, one of the biggest threats to our planet. Um, and we are using mathematical models, like the ones shown here, to try to understand and predict what is going to happen. Um, so these are the results of five different models looking at different CO2 emissions over the next century. Um, but again, it's the maths that's key to helping us try to understand and hopefully stop this problem. Um, we've got a more recent example that threatened human existence over the last few years, uh, COVID, COVID-19. So this is an example of uh, a model that was used in the UK to assist the government with making decisions, trying to look at how the disease was spreading and what might happen depending on the decisions that they made. Um, so two pretty important uh, problems that we're using mathematical modeling uh, to try to solve, try to understand. Uh, I've got one more for you that I have certainly spent way too much time uh, trying to understand myself, uh, which is the YouTube algorithm, uh, the mysterious black box that decides which videos do and don't do well on YouTube. Um, but what I spend most of my time trying to understand, in fact, with mathematical modeling, is the problem of ocean pollution. Um, so this figure shows uh, a map of the planet, um, and it shows uh, the concentration of plastic around the world. Now, the warmer colors, the reds, represent a higher concentration uh, of plastic, and there are four uh, images, and each one represents different size plastic in the ocean. Um, so there are two key things here, I would say. First of all is the scale of the problem, like there's a lot of plastic in the ocean, is hopefully what you're seeing from that. Um, and secondly, there is a consistency across all four figures about where the highest concentration is. And it's actually in this area here, which is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Um, so this is more than 50 times the size of Belgium, which is, quite frankly, ridiculous. Um, and if we don't do something about the issue of plastic pollution in our oceans, I think this could be a real threat to our existence, again, as a species. Um, so this is the problem I was working on for four years during my PhD. Um, and I was using mathematical modeling to try to help us understand this issue of plastic pollution in the ocean. And I sort of broke down the problem into three steps. And I'm going to call it my three-step method for constructing a mathematical model. Um, and I will outline those steps shortly. And I'm going to go into detail for the remainder of the talk about those three steps applied to this particular case of ocean pollution. But what I would like you to all think about, and I'll reiterate this again at the end, 
is how can you use this three-step process to actually apply a mathematical model to a problem of your own? OK, so step one, look at the real world. What can we learn about the situation by observing what is happening? Can we see which factors are important and which ones might not be important in a particular situation? Step two, collect data. The more data you have, the better, whether that's from field work, like me on a ship, um, in Force 11 Storms, or whether that's doing experiments in a lab, which is actually another major part of my PhD I'll talk about, or that could be computer simulations. Of course, a very big thing at the moment in science as well. But we want as much data as possible to check against our model. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, given I'm a mathematician, uh, is to derive the equations, do the actual maths to give you something, to give you the answer to the original question or the original problem you were trying to understand. Um, so, as I said, I'll now go into a bit more detail of these three steps for this issue of ocean pollution and how I tried to tackle it. Um, so, look at the real world. Um, I'll start with a statistic. 80% um, of pollution in the ocean, marine pollution, actually comes from the land. Um, so this is from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in the US. Um, and what this tells us is sort of, or what this should make us think, is how does this pollution get from the land to the ocean? And the answer is through rivers. So whether it's pollution being dumped directly into rivers or waterways, or whether it's chemical pollution, fertilizers that seep through the soil into the water table, it ends up in the rivers, and then it flows out into the ocean. So if we're going to understand this issue of ocean pollution, we need to look at rivers. Because if we understand where the river water goes, we then actually know where the pollution goes. And that was kind of the crux of this problem and how I investigated it. Um, so, let's look at some rivers. Um, the first one here is the Amazon River, uh, which is located on the equator. So this is a satellite image the, uh, taken actually at the end of the rainy season. So the brown water is the river water. It's filled with sediment. So you can actually see what is river water and what is ocean. Um, and if I color it in yellow, just to really emphasize it, uh, you can see it spreads out everywhere. Now, if we look at another river, um, this is the Connecticut River in the United States. Again, it's filled with sand. And if I color it in yellow, it does something completely different. It appears to get to the coast and then make a right-hand turn, is how I would describe that. And then let's look at a third and final example, which is the Burdekin River in Australia in the Southern Hemisphere. And here, again, highlighted in yellow, this one appears to turn to the left. Now, what this is actually telling us by observing the real world, what this is telling us is the Earth's rotation is actually controlling where the river water goes and therefore is controlling where the pollution goes. So for me as a modeler, I want to build an experiment. It had better rotate. And I want to build and solve some equations. They had better include rotation. So this was the main takeaway from observing the problem in the real world. It's got to be something that's going to rotate. Um, so step two, collect the data. As I mentioned, I did experiments. I did over 700 experiments over a two-year period. They were very long days and nights um, in the lab. Uh, this is what my setup looked like. Um, if it looks like a giant fish tank, that's because it is. I bought it at a pet store. <laughs> it's about a meter cube uh, in size. I would fill this with salt water, so that's my ocean. The whole thing then rotates. So as we've seen, rotation is really important. Um, and then coming through the hose pipe at the back, that would feed in fresh water, which is going to be our river. Uh, and I can dye that red so I can very clearly distinguish between the river water and the ocean. Now, one of the main advantages of doing experiments in the lab is I get to play God. Um, and I do enjoy this. <laughs> I won't pretend otherwise. Because the Earth has a fixed rotation rate. It rotates once every 24 hours. I cannot control that, no matter how hard I try. But in the lab, 
I can control how fast my model of the ocean, of the Earth, is rotating. And I can see how that impacts what happens to our pollution, our river water. Um, so I can control the rotation rate. Um, and I'm going to label this with the letter F. I will be showing you the results, the equations at the end. So if equations are your thing, remember the letter F is the rotation rate. I can also control how much water I feed in from my river. I can control the size of my river by having more water or less water flow into the rotating tank. So that's going to be the river volume, which I'm going to label with Q. And finally, I can control how much salt I put into the salt water. So I can control the density of the seawater or the density of the ocean. So I thought I would show you an experiment. Um, so this is filmed from above, uh, the same as the satellite images. The tank rotates anti-clockwise, so it's modeling the northern hemisphere, which is why we have the image of the Connecticut River in the US, which is in the northern hemisphere. Um, so the freshwater is red, it's going to come in at the bottom, it's going to immediately turn to the right because of the rotation. It looks like the image, which is always nice. Uh, and again, important why we look at the real world. And what else we see here is this formation of a current flowing along the edge of my tank. So in the real world situation, this is flowing along the coast. And this current is really big. So these things can be hundreds, if not thousands of kilometers in size. So you basically have, leaving a river, a stream of river water containing a load of pollution traveling potentially hundreds, even thousands of kilometers along the coast. So it's hitting all of those towns and maybe even neighboring countries further along the coast. So again, to understand the problem of pollution, we need to understand, we want to know, the properties of these pollution-carrying currents. And that's what I'm going to need to derive in the equations. Um, so step three is to derive the equations. Um, so far, I've been talking a lot about fluids, about water. It's an area of maths called fluid dynamics. Um, it turns out we have a set of equations that we use to model anything that's a fluid. They're called the Navier-Stokes equations. They look like this. Mildly terrifying to some of you, I'm sure. Um, now, these are very, very complicated. They're so complicated, there is a literal million dollar prize for anyone who can help us to understand these equations. That is how complicated they are. Um, and one of the reasons they're so complicated is they model every single fluid. And when I say a fluid, the scientific definition is something that changes shape to fit the container that it's held in. So, obviously, a liquid, water, the ocean, will change shape to fit the container you put it in. So too will gases, the atmosphere. So too will some solids, ice flowing through a glacier, and even sand. So that's, ocean, that's liquids, that's gases, and that's solids. Anything else that changes shape to fit the container that you put it in. How about cats? <laughs> and I'm only half joking, because there's obviously a mathematical model telling you all about cats. Um, real piece of mathematical research. Um, but back to the Navier-Stokes equations. This is my starting point. I'm modeling a fluid. So I make some assumptions, I make some simplifications, and I get an answer. Um, and the equations I get are the following. I have this one labeled H0, which this is the depth of the pollution. I get this one labeled W0, which is the extent of the pollution away from the coast. So this tells you the area over which the pollution has spread from a particular river. And I get U0, which tells you the speed of the pollution. So incredibly important information for any river in the world you just input certain variables for any river anywhere in the world, and these equations tell you how deep the pollution is from that river, how far of an area it extends over, and how fast it's moving. Really, really valuable information. And if you look a little closer, we've got our three letters. F for the rotation rate, we've got Q for the river volume, and we've got G prime for the ocean density. And this information is readily available 
on the internet. And to prove this point, I did this example for the River Meuse in Belgium, uh, which I believe flows here. Wikipedia tells me the location of the river, which gives me the rotation rate. On the same box, I get the size of the river, which gives me the volume. And then from a second Google search, I figure out the density of the North Sea, so that gives me my third variable for G prime. I get my answers for the depth, the width, and the velocity. So on a map, this tells you all of the pollution that's in the River Meuse in Belgium ends up on the Dutch coast. <laughs> so read your own conclusions from that. Um, but <laughs> I thought you might enjoy that one. Uh, <laughs> But incredibly important and valuable information from the mathematical model, from following the three-step process. Um, so just to reiterate, look at the real world, collect data, derive equations. Now, just to end, I'm going to share with you three very quick and final examples, which are my favorite applications of this process to understand particular problems. And again, think about yourselves. How can you use this to help solve a problem in your own life? Um, so I'm from England. Um, the England men's football team, they're pretty bad at penalties. Um, we have a 30% win ratio. Um, Germany's 86. Belgium, surprisingly, is 100. Uh, we'd like to be like Germany and Belgium. So mathematical modeling will tell you, and I did this calculation, where to aim your penalty kick to maximize your chance of success. It's six foot off the ground and two feet inside the post. So mathematical modeling can help England to maybe finally win a penalty shootout. What about another big issue, finding the one, finding true love? Again, there's a mathematical model for that. It's called optimal stopping theory. It says you should ignore the first 37% of people you date, they're your sample, and then compare everyone else against those people. And the first time someone is better than all of them, that's your lifelong partner according to maths. Um, and, but the most important, at least to me, is the mathematical model which will tell you how to catch a Pokemon. <laughs> so, um, again, um, I hope I've convinced you of the, the power of mathematical modeling and how we can use it not only, again, to save the planet, but also to leave you with a question of how can you use mathematical modeling to solve a problem in your life. Thank you very much.